Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29, a podcast where we look at the <laughs> NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. We might not talk about uh, all that much Atlanta today because we're we're going to start with, uh, you know, looking at the conference finals. Um, and Glenn, you know, based on what you did on the conference semifinals predictions, do, do you have any stock tips or business advice? I think we could make some money if I, if I just do the complete opposite of what you suggest. That's, that's probably a pretty good strategy. I, I don't, but I have a lot of uh, Lakers fans begging me to pick Denver in this series for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> I, uh, so yeah. So the last, the last series I had Boston winning and uh, that's the only one I got right. And that was kind of kind of I don't know say the obvious one it's the one that went seven, <laughs> um, but yeah that was it's been a wild this year. Well, but maybe before we go on to the conference finals, what, what do you make of Philadelphia? You know, sort of getting to seven games and then just whatever that was in the second half. Uh, it, is 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 this some kind of major? inflection point for the trajectory of that franchise are they going to change coaches are they going to change the roster is it salvageable like what what do you what are you thinking of in terms of what they've got there yeah it uh so it's kind of funny because we we could have kind of half started with Atlanta and talked about Doc Rivers you know and his situation and you know I the, the thing for me is I know like the narrative out there is that Doc is a bad coach. Doc's lost a million game sevens. Doc's been ahead in series and lost them. I still think he's one of the better coaches in the league. But when it just comes to kind of covering all the normal stuff that coaches need to cover, I think he has a good staff. You know, I've, I've said for a while, I think Sam Cassell is going to be a really good head coach one day, um, you know, and, and such. But I, you know, uh, it's like when Milwaukee, I thought Milwaukee made a mistake letting go of Bud, except for the fact that I just think Bud needs a break. Like, and it's hard for a team to say, take a year <laughs> and then come back, you know. I mean, maybe somebody will innovate and take that kind of approach at some point in time. The continuity is still there and stuff, but say you need a break. I, I It feels like Doc is has kind of done his thing for as long as he can. And I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a change. Uh, for me, when I look at that situation – um, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a big Harden guy. I, I don't, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, I don't, I don't root against people. Um, but Harden is just a guy that hasn't made me feel confident that he's going to kind of do what he needs to do in game sevens. And, you know, when the series gets really, really tight, really, really deep, he just hasn't for whatever reason, be able to kind of do that. It's part of that conditioning and getting to a seventh game, you know, uh, I, and it's, it may be a little lazy to say conditioning, but he has a his body type is not perfect, you know, for the NBA, you know, and the, there's a certain amount of it is, is maybe that. But then I, th- I think at the same time, for when I look at Daryl Morey, I, I think the trade he made for Harden was a fine trade, just kind of on paper, you know, in terms of what he gave up and what he got. Harden's a first ballot Hall of Famer, great, great career, great player, no doubt about that. He's a phenomenal career. Um, but I, I sometimes I think when we as people kind of go back to the old plan, you know, which was Harden was kind of what he built around in Houston and and couldn't quite kind of get enough around Harden there. And it seemed like in Houston, players didn't want to keep coming back to play with him in a lot of cases. I, I don't know that that's the fact. It just kind of looks looks that way that, you know, players kind of came and moved on. And I mean, and I think sort of Clint's stuff. always you know, donned high praise and, and suggested yeah. that he loved that. And, you know, he, he, I think, you know, in social media, he still actively roots for, for James. Yeah. But that, but Clint, maybe, maybe he might be the exception. Right. He's, he's also yeah. a, a sweetheart of a teammate. And, and to be fair, like Harden, Harden made him get paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so I'd be, I'd be loyal yeah. too, you know? Yeah. So, so to me, it's the, it, it, I just see like a bad vibe there. You know, two years ago, it was Ben Simmons passing up the layup. There were way more issues in that series and in that game than that play. But it's the it's what everybody seems to talk about. Um, and then, you know, last year, uh, you know, the Embiid injury, which has been uh, an unfortunate pattern uh, as well. And this year, it's just they, they didn't – they I felt like they, they didn't compete in the second half. They just didn't compete. And that's the way it looked to me. 
And is that a, a leadership issue among players? Is that players not buying into each other? Is that play or is it players just being like, we don't have enough? You know, we know we don't have enough, you know. So it's hard to hard to kind of get your motivation kind of worked up. But that my answer is kind of all over the place, but I, I feel like there's a fundamental issue there. I don't think it's a small issue. I don't think it can be fixed on the margins. I think there's a big issue there. Um, but, you know, I'm not inside that organization anyway either. What, what do you see? I just, speaking of Clint, you know, there was a couple of years ago, sort of mid-series when, when the Hawks were playing Philadelphia, and he said something to the effect of, you know, the – he was he was very upfront in a way that you don't usually hear players talk about other players. But he's just like you you've got to get Embiid tired. Like that's that's the way to beat him. And yep. that that's what happened in the second half. Was like their plan was to go at Embiid. Like you know they had Robert Williams screening. They they would get Tatum on Embiid and and just kind of let him work. And it didn't seem like they had a unified plan. Like. You know, there were situations where there were miscommunication. It's like, you know, one player was was trying to guard that Tatum pick and roll one way and and you know yeah. Embiid was was guarding it another way. And it's it, it just seemed like I, I wasn't expecting that, I guess. I mean, I was not expecting that he was going to be the defensive weak link that just got tormented over and over again like it was it was not uh it was not haphazard it was very methodical and they're like you're you're the one we want uh we're gonna yeah. go with you and and it worked yeah and the, the thing i have to say too about Embiid, I mean, Embiid had a phenomenal season the work he has put into his game is amazing we took we talked the last time on we recorded about that great pass he made to harden for the game winner you know earlier in the series and the playmaking and and I must say too, like his conditioning was noticeably better this year across the season. Yeah. I you saw him sprint a lot more this year than ever before. Um and but you know, was he chasing the MVP? You know, did he play too many regular season games? You know, you, you'd think that he maybe kind of got some of that back with that quick first round series they had with Brooklyn. Right. You know. Um uh and so you know, maybe the plan for him should be you're playing 60, you know, that's, that's it. You know, I, I don't know that that's the answer, but it, it makes me wonder if he pushed so hard uh, to have the season he, he, he had. And, and why, I mean, I understand him being a competitor wanting to prove something. Hey, I can play all the games. I can get myself in that kind of shape. I can be that impactful across the whole regular season. And so I understand that coming from a place of, being a competitor and wanting to do as much as you can for your team and your franchise. I, you know, I, I don't have any reason to think it was anything other than that, but I think that maybe if the, and again, not to be critical, but just look back and see, what did we learn? Maybe that was too much, you know, maybe that was too much. So, but, but in addition to that, they're just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's funny to talk about Clint being pro James because the, basically the last thing they tried at Houston was getting rid of Clint, not playing and playing with <laughs> That was like the last, basically the last thing they tried. Um, but you know, Clint, Clint is a, you know, a little bit like me, a really positive guy, supportive guy, and um, you know, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, 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 there's there's something off there that I'm not sure what it is, but it feels like more than just let's make the roster a little better. All right. Well, conference finals. Uh, maybe we'll start in the East since we were just talking about Philadelphia. What are, what are you looking for in a Heat Celtics series? Yeah. So I put this out on Twitter last night, and I'm I'm curious to see what your response is. So I look at this and I think Boston is a much better team than Miami. You know, Miami. I mean, Spo is in just ridiculously good. I mean, maybe the best coach in the league right now. I mean, that very well could be the case. If he's not the best, he's second or third or something like that, right? But they're playing Kevin Love, you know, and and uh, and, and Kevin Love like has been a positive. Like his outlet passing, his rebounding, his shooting. You know, exposed to putting him in the right spots, getting him off the floor when you know he's going to be more exposed defensively. But uh, but you know, Boston is the better team. Um, they have more shooting. They have uh, more guys that can guard Jimmy Butler than any team that they've kind of faced to this point in time. Um, but on the other side, 
Spoh's a better coach than Missoula. And I, I don't say that to say that I think Missoula's a bad coach. I think Missoula's going to be a good coach. He's young, but this is, this is still his first year. And, and so I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, Boston has more talent. Boston has more. And they, Boston was, like, second in offense and defense, and Miami was basically, what, like, around 20th, you know, uh, you know. And um, so it, it's that alone just kind of jumps out at you. But then you get into a playoff series, and it's like, how much can Spo help make up ground for the talent deficiency just through his sheer coaching? And um, that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of kind of keeping an eye on. Going along with that, then how does? Uh... Spo deal with what Boston does in terms of spacing because they are probably the best at what they do and it's it's something maybe that you can contain in short stretches but it sure seems hard to do it for 48 minutes a game over a seven game series yeah I mean I have a hard time seeing how Kevin Love plays a lot at the four uh, I wonder if Kevin Love plays minutes at the five in this series I think there's a lot of Martin uh, you know, at the four with Martin and Jimmy at the three and the four, you know, a lot of that Martin, Martin's really good. Uh, I wonder like if we'll see a little bit more Highsmith, you know, in here because of the athleticism, he can really uh, cover um, territory on the defensive end of the court. Um, and so I, I, you know, and then, uh, you know, they're going to make, I think really try to make Lowry move too. Lowry is just so equipped to like know where to be when to see every sees everything that's coming for as much as i give him a hard time about all of his antics which is all deserved <laughs> on the flip side he's a smarter player there is in the league i mean unquestionably he sees everything that's coming and even though he's a little older and and still kind of you know carry an extra 15 pounds or you know or whatever it is he gets there i mean more times than not he gets there because he starts early you know and he kind of just kind of sees it coming uh, but I think Boston's going to challenge that. Boston spaces the floor like no other team in the league. Um, Denver may be kind of a close second the way that they kind of function around Jokic. But uh, I, I think it's going to be tough because Miami just doesn't have a lot of foot speed. You know, how does Struce function against that Boston offense? That's hard for me to envision. You know, um, so they're going to have to be really connected and really on time with their rotations and – Bust their tail on every single closeout, which Spo will expect of his team, you know. Um, and so that's for me, I, I just don't see the foot speed and the mobility on defense to kind of cover it all. But I'm not going to be shocked if Spo kind of figures out a way to kind of get them to do a little better or maybe even more than a little better in that area than I than I, I than you would expect based upon kind of what they what they have. One of the things that Miami does is they tend to play more styles than than most teams. Does 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 Boston and the way they play sort of limit that? Like, do, do they lose some of that versatility that they have, and they pretty much just have to play one way, just sort of tread water almost, or or is it, can they vary things in the way that they often do? No, I mean, for me, I, I the thing that Miami, I think, is going to start with on defense is they're going to try to turn Boston over. You know, Boston doesn't really have, like, a point guard, you know. I mean, White is kind of a point guard. Brogdon has played a lot of point guard, but he's still not what you kind of think of. And the guy who handles the ball a lot and just takes care of the ball and kind of gets them into their stuff, it's a, it's a distributed responsibility for them. I still think Jalen Brown is, uh, I mean, he's gotten better, you know, but um, I still think he's a guy you can kind of turn over. And so I think they're just going to be really aggressive, really physical, try to create turnovers, try to create easy points in transition. Um, and I think that's going to be kind of what they start with and and, and kind of kind of go from there. And, and I just think so much of it is going to be physicality. I think a lot of it is that, like, they ha if they can't match the spacing and the foot speed – in this collective skill that Boston puts on the floor. So they're going to have to win the physicality, I, th I think. So style, physical, get into them, turn the ball over, kind of get get out and, and run. They'll rim run like crazy. Bam will rim run. Jimmy will rim run, rim run like he does a lot. And they'll try to try to make that work, I think. But that's the, the, the thing I'm watching for kind of from a schematic standpoint is, you know, Miami loves to stress you 
and isolate two of their guys on the weak side. Usually the traditional kind of just force distribution is two on the strong side, three on the weak side, right? Miami runs a lot of stuff that's three on the strong side, two on the weak side. And I'm just anxious to see with Boston's tendency to want to put Robert Williams in, in, in a lot of cases, Al Horper also, um, on, on the guy in the weak side corner. Um, and so I, I'm, I can't wait to see how Spo attacks that, try, tries to attack that with just two on that side. It, it's harder to cover all that space with only two offensive players on that side. And so that that's kind of the, the first thing I can't wait to see what happens there. So it's going to, I mean, I don't know that it's going to be a, a stylistic thing that's new or different or are really limited. I think they're going to be physical. I think they're going to try to turn them over. I think they're going to try to get easy points in transition. But when they get into the half court, I want to see how they attack Boston's tendency to want to put their big on the weak side corner and how they either use space on the strong side or you um, use for extra space on the weak side with the two, two on the weak side. I can't, I, I'm just, I can't wait to see what Spoh does with that. How do you think, you know, you, you mentioned physicality being sort of maybe the one advantage or the main advantage that Miami has. How, how does Boston try to guard Butler? Because that's one of the more grueling tasks in dealing with Miami. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I wonder if they'll, mix it up um i mean i tend to think it might start with Jalen brown um and just because i don't think you want to start the series with tatum with like that much defensive workload uh brown just has more you know more strength and more bulk to kind of you know deal with all that physicality butler tries to tries to bring to that um and so i think it starts there but i think i think brockton spends a decent might spend a decent amount of time on him as well. Really? Um, yeah, it, it just in terms of kind of keeping the ball in front. Brockton's Brockton's a big dude. He, I mean, he's a really, really big dude. Um, and when I kind of think about the next guy, it's like, yeah, Tatum, you probably take his fair share of turns. I don't, I'm not sure why it'll be kind of kind of that. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think is that's Marcus what I Smart think. in the mix? Uh, sure. Yeah, could be. Um, yeah, try to think of the the rest of the way that aligns. I I think Marcus Smart is such a good help defender, and and he I mean he's really really good kind of with his timing, kind of coming off the weak side, and getting in there. So I I think that's maybe a plan B for me. But I mean I mean but I could be wrong if they start with Marcus Smart on him. But um, Marcus Smart's like a way better help defender than like Jalen Brown is. So sometimes you coaches, especially smart coaches, will just take the lesser help defender and just throw them at the point of attack and use you know set up their help defenders to be available to be helpers. What sort of whistle do you expect from the officials when Marcus Smart runs into Kyle Lowry and everybody goes falling in a complete one eighty? Um, I I think the universe might pause like for 30 seconds and, and just give her advice the time to kind of figure out, figure that out. I think I made a joke a couple of years ago that uh, I, I don't remember who it was Lowry and someone. And they, it was like a, a play where they both players flopped. And I talked about yeah. like, it seemed like the, the ground <laughs> opened up and started, you know, it was gra- extra gravity was pulling them to the ground. So they, that, that department, this is like an all time match. <laughs> I mean, you, they, they, you mentioned him as a help defender. Like that might be a, a matchup that they're, you know, on each other. Like having Smart as a help defender, putting him on Lowry, kind of giving him the chance to like box out, and that. I mean, they they yeah. might spend a fair amount of time together. Lowry will go down and put a put a body on a on a rebounder who's way bigger than him, and then just fall over if he doesn't get his, and get the call. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Butler is the best at this. So in the NBA, a trip. On, when the when the ball handler is tripped, especially on a drive or whatever, is always a defensive foul. And Jimmy will just run right into a defender and and trip himself over the defender's leg and fall down. Jimmy, he'll do that a lot in the he'll do that in the series. And Marcus Smart will just, I mean, you, there's no way to anticipate what where it'll show up for Marcus Smart. He'll do stuff that he's never done before. I like I feel like I, I can I can see what Lowry does. Lowry's gonna go. Stop at the nail, let somebody run over him and get the call. Gonna go help rebound and throw himself on the baseline and get the call. 
Jimmy's going to trip himself on the defender's leg. You know, that's going to happen. Um, and, but Marcus Smart, I, I'm not even going to try to predict like where his artistry uh, is going to, going to kind of show up here, but uh, it'll, it'll certainly be there. But oh, I, I hope it's just contained just enough that it doesn't distract me personally from being able to join, enjoy the rest of like how, how rich this series should be and, you know, watchability. Uh, you you want to switch to the Western Who, Conference now? Which which, which team shortens the rotation first? Do you think of these two? Shortens the rotation. Does it just does it just depend upon who, how game one goes and who wins, or you know? Uh, I mean, I I maybe Boston does it first, just because I when I think of Boston shortening the rotation, to me yeah. that's okay. Grant Williams is out, and this doesn't really seem like a series that fits him all that well yeah uh, you know i think he's more useful against you know the milwaukee's and the, the philadelphia's where you've got to have more big bodies miami doesn't really have that so maybe boston i guess i would say this yeah that makes that makes sense uh and missoula like he shortened his rotation against the hawks in the first round you know he played like seven and a quarter guys like in game yeah. two or whatever one. so this feels like to me like Probably Celtics and six. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, the, the, the other side is I'm lost. Like, Lake, so Denver is the better team. I've underestimated them all year long. I picked them to be seventh in the, in the, in the seventh seed at the end of the regular season in the West. I didn't like their, I didn't think KCP would fit in like he has. I thought they'd miss Monte Morris a lot more than they they have. Bruce Brown has been so good for them. AG has been so – I mean, just keeps getting better every year. And I thought they would lose to Phoenix, you know. And um, I just thought – I thought Booker and KD would, would be more than what – you know. So, for me, it's like – and maybe I'll let you kind of start this off so I'm not doing all the talking here. But how – how does how do Jokic and AG deal with AD and LeBron? Right? Can't can MPJ play at the four in this series much at all? Is his or is his minutes gonna have to be cut? You know, um, so for me, it kind of starts with I think we know what Jokic can do. I mean, there's not a team in the league that's really gonna take Jokic out of this game. There just there just isn't right in terms of what he does on offense, but in terms of like the Lakers trying to really go at him and make him work on defense and have that be a strategy for, um, you know, making him exert himself on that end. But for me, it kind of starts with how, how, how difficult is it going to be for AG and Jokic to go with LeBron and AD? What's your sense about of, of that? I mean, I guess if I back up to where you said that, you know, Denver is the better team, I hesitate on that a little bit. I don't know yeah. that I would agree with that. I just think that the Lakers are are late bloomers. I think that the trades that they made and the way they set themselves up after the deadline, they're a much different, much more functional team than what they were before. So, you know, we have a bigger sample size for Denver. They did it all season long, but I think what the Lakers have is not a fluke. It's it's real. And I, you know, Rob Plink and company deserve a lot of credit for or maybe maybe LeBron deserves a lot of credit for, you know, getting the right people in to make this work. Yeah, yeah but, well, I yeah, yeah, for me, uh, like LeBron, and I want to kick it back to you. Like, but I said this about Golden State, LeBron knows what it takes to win in this context. For sure. And we don't know that Denver has can kind of go into a series like that that we haven't seen them do it yet. You know, so there, there's that question. So I think it's fair to say, I think, I think Denver has more, more collective skill. I think they have more talent on that side in terms of like roster to roster, but man, Le, like we're talking about Larry being smart. LeBron is 
as smart of a of a player as there is. And I think Darvin Ham and his staff deserve a ton of credit for how they managed the Golden State series. Just absolutely. I was <laughs> they blew me away. They put yep. Golden State on their heels early in that series and had Golden State trying to find a solution, which was just so unusual to see. So I so I you know Denver has, I think, in my mind, more collective skill, et cetera. But man, the Lakers game planned and executed in that Golden State series so impressively. And that's that's what makes me feel like I have no idea what to expect. I, I literally have no clue. So, like, you know, what what did the Lakers exploit against the Warriors? I think what they exploited was the fact that you know the Warriors had to pick that they you know. They either had to have some some size to deal with LeBron and AD. And if they did that, they just didn't have the offensive dynamism to to match up and keep scoring at a pace that the Lakers like. Like they just there's just not enough shooting, not enough scoring, not enough playmaking aside from Draymond. Like it's just there's just not enough there with, with the players that they could put in the front court. So Yep. It's very different with Denver, right? Like that this Super is completely different. different. And, it, and this Denver team is so so different just because you know Aaron Gordon is is we haven't really seen like a full playoff run with healthy Jamal Murray, healthy Aaron Gordon right. aside Jokic. And so, you know, you kind of have to throw all the past Denver stuff out too. You do. And I'm a as you know, I'm a big huge Jamal Murray guy. Uh it's funny because I've been I've my expert I've underestimated him all year long, but I love this is why one of my favorite teams in the league. I, I love Jamal Murray. I love Aaron Gordon. I love Mike Malone. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, KCP, you know, on and on and on. Bruce Brown, love what he brings, but, you know, and <laughs> it's just kind of funny because it, what did the Lakers do against the Warriors? Well, they committed to chasing, chasing their shooters over screens and in space and got up the floor. And as soon as Kerr was like that, and, and this is, in, this is Kerr's, playbook like page one we're going to draw you out with our shooting and then we're going to kill you at the round and darvin ham and his coaching staff and lebron and ad were like we can get there we can we, we can get to the rim we you know Le, lebron weak side rim helper ad covering a lot of ground they're like we're good we can get there and they yep. did you know and that was the thing and the, it's kind of funny when i look back and i think it was game five where i saw times where like the lakers were kind of in third gear on defense and I, as I look back, I'm like, that's when I should have known the Lakers are going to win this series. Because LeBron is famous for not overexerting himself to saving enough for the full four series, you know, for the full for the full run. And I, I saw him jogging back on defense a few times in a way that he didn't look stressed about it. I saw him, like, st- flat-footed, like his man screening, you know, the guy he's guarding when he's on defense is screening. He's not communicating, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and was just kind of, I guess in the time I was like, if they keep playing like this, the Warriors are going to beat them. And I, now when I look back, I'm like, I should have known LeBron I was like, I'm good. We're good. We, we got this. And you see that from LeBron all the time. I think back to the, the Raptor series. I think it was the Raptor series a few years ago, like four or five years ago, whatever it was when he was still in Cleveland. And, and, it went to a game. They were down. They got down three, two or whatever, went to game seven or whatever. And someone asked him about the pressure. And LeBron was like, this, this isn't pressure. I felt pressure. This is not pressure. And LeBron was like, we're winning this game. You know, we're going to win this game. And so I feel like, you know, in game five, when I saw that, instead of being like, Oh my God, the Lakers are going to be in trouble. I should have been, I may, I feel like maybe I should have been like LeBron has this measured because he always has it measured. You know, he right. always has it measured, you know, and it's going to be fascinating to see, like, if if I feel like I'm seeing that in this series because the Denver throws so much at you, you know. So I, I, I can't wait. Yeah, that, that I mean, you know, this is going to be so much fun. So the Warriors, you know, when they did have some success on offense, it felt like a lot of it happened when they could get AD up the court defensively. Yep. Uh, you know, into action so that he wasn't just covering up stuff at the rim. With Jokic out there, like, how do the Lakers match up in the front court? And, you know, how do they keep AD at at the rim for what they need for him there, but also 
you know, cover up in all the other ways that you need to, to deal with Denver. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, for me, it's like, I feel like, if I say on paper, AD kind of has the skill set you want for Jokic. Like he's long, he's pretty much, he's mobile for a big. Where I, where I think where all of our heads go probably is if AD has to deal with that for seven games, like what's the likelihood he gets it through the series without getting hurt? It right. just, it's exertion and workload tends to eventually get him, you mm-hmm. know? And so I feel like Darvin Ham has to have another plan. Will LeBron spend some time on, on him? You know, I, I don't think so, but it's not like totally crazy. It's not because where else do they go? You know, like do they stick you know, somebody else in the rotation that they haven't been using? Like, I mean, who? Like Rui? I, no, I mean, Tr- you know, Tr- Tristan Thompson. Like, what? You know, I mean, I, maybe, when you I mean, Gabriel, I, I don't know who. Like, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, when and Gabriel will, will foul Jokic on every defensive possession. I love when and Gabriel. He's just not experienced enough to do right. to handle this, right? So can. I, what is Tristan Thompson right now? I have no idea. Like, is he <laughs> is he an actual player? I don't you know. I don't know. I don't know. And and then you know, Mobama's over there, and like that is, there's no way that that's a thing, you know, yeah, in this situation. Um, but you know, the other thing that the Warriors did was like when they would catch D'Angelo Russell on the floor and go at him, and Darwin stopped playing him until Dennis got thrown out that one game. You know, and then he had to put D'Lo back on the floor. And so a part of me is like, I think alone, I think I think the Nuggets are gonna go at D'Lo, you know. Right. And um and and I think that's gonna be a thing like can can D'Lo stay on the court? Right. Does, does does Troy Brown does Troy Brown does Troy Brown is a probably a better defensive fit in this series? Mm-hmm. You know, does does Vanderbilt spend time on Jokic? You know, I, I, I think I could see that, you know. Yeah. Um, but he's he needs help rebounding. Yep. <laughs> you know, so so you know, this is I mean, I I kind of pride myself on watching enough of this and having enough of my own like coaching experience to feel like okay, like with Miami, I'm like, I can't wait to see what Spo does with the Celtics big and the weak side corner, et cetera. You know, in this series, I, I don't know where Darvin Ham starts. I, I have no I have no feel for it. I have no I mean I guess it's AD. But that can't be like in my mind. AD can't play more than like twenty minutes, depending a game, depending Jokic. There has to be something else there, and maybe he starts with Vanderbilt and sees how it goes. You know? Yeah, I mean, this definitely seems like a series where Vanderbilt, um, yeah, Vanderbilt can play more than he did in the Warriors yeah. series. Like, I think his minutes go up in this series compared to what he saw against Golden State. Yeah, but this is where I mean, this is the series where I'm like, you know, Rui being half in the rotation troy brown at different points being half in the rotation um you know lonnie walker you know was really helpful towards the end of that war but like like, can he give you kind of that game in game out seven games um and can gabriel give you spot minutes when Jokic is off the floor you know and so i mean in my mind the lakers have a harder the formula is harder for the lakers but I'm just not going to put it past that coaching staff. I think Chris Jett's a really, like, a really underrated assistant <laughs> coach in the league. You know, again, we're anchoring this back to Atlanta in a sense, right? The way we like to. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I think Denver is su- such a tough guard, and I think my guess is LeBron goes into the series thinking a shorter series is more winnable for us, so we got to go hard right out of the gate. Um, because I just think the workload for LeBron and AD is, when this gets to six and seven games is just too much, you know. But maybe, <laughs> maybe that's why we saw them in third gear, you know, in game five, you know, in that last series. You know, Le- Le- LeBron always hasn't measured, he always hasn't measured. Uh, can they, can they figure it out here? I can't wait to find out. Um, are you kind of leaning towards the Lakers as, as who you think is going to win the series? I am, yeah. Yeah, I man, this is like 50 50, you know. So, um, I think, I think, I think I'm gonna go 50.1 percent for Denver. Just, I think the home home court at elevation, and I and I think this is one where con- continuity Denver's been working on this for a long time and building up for this. I'm not sitting here thinking I don't feel confident picking either team. Like I have no I have no idea like 
who's going to, which team is going to put the other on their heels first, who's going to have to be dealing with like a, an urgent adjustment first. I don't have any feel for how that's going to go. But if you ask me who's most likely to win, I guess I give Denver a little edge because the home court and just because they have more, they have more guys that can play in without vulnerabilities, obvious vulnerabilities in this series than the Lakers do. The Lakers are going to have to really construct lineups well to not expose themselves. Um, so I, I guess I guess Denver and all the Lakers fans are going to be on Twitter thanking me for this. It's 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 so funny because when the Lakers, you know, I had put and you 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 retweeted it or whatever you did. The Warriors are going to smoke the Lakers, <laughs> and all these Lakers fans came into my mentions and were like, "Oh, you better delete this." I'm like, "I'm not deleting that. That's not my style at all." And like, come and get me. Like, fair, you know, I'm fair game. It was, it was I I was wrong, you know, and I just had fun with them. You know, and, and it was actually really fun, like 24 hours, like Lakers fans were like ready to kind of get my throat and think that I was going to be defensive. And I wasn't defensive at all. It, in this series, I think I'm just going to try to just enjoy it more I mean, more, more than try to kind of think. Maybe after game one, I'll have a feel for kind of way I'm trying to think along with the coaches or whatever. Right now, man, I don't, I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to expect. I think it's going to be a great series. I think it's be. I think it's gonna be a great. I think. I think Boston and Miami is gonna be kind of a slugfest. I think it's gonna get more physical every every game, and yeah. you know, I think it's gonna get pretty gnarly. On the other side, I think it's. I think it's gonna be just great basketball. Just, I mean, just really engaging, watchable basketball on that side. Of just, I can't. I can't remember the last time I had a series that was like really just. Maybe a Spurs Warrior series from six years ago or whatever it was, you know, right? Something like that. But this is this is as good as it gets. Yeah, like I think that was one of the most uh, fun stretches to watch of Jokic in his entire career was that uh, that bubble series against the Lakers. Like they they didn't yeah. win that series, but man, that that was a turning point for me. Like, okay, I, I see it. Like, I mean, I always thought he was a great player. Like. Sh- Dude, I I thought the Bucks should have tried to draft him in the second round when they had a gazillion second round picks that draft. I was like, that's yeah. that's a promising young kid right there. Yeah. And and they picked Dummy in English. But man, I mean, I I think you said it earlier. Uh, to me, the deciding factor is does AD stay healthy? Like I think if he yeah. stays healthy, the Lakers win. I think you know there's there's that's, so that's, much physicality fair. with Aaron Gordon and Jokic and. You know, if he can't hold up, then then I think it swings back to Denver. Yeah. Let's just say good night, Bob. Oh, good night, Bob. <laughs> Let's just have fun watching the series. It's gonna be fun. Boston and Miami, rough. On the other side, a lot of fun. All right. Good night, Bob, once more. Good night, Bob. <laughs>